Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hope for Animals Summit. Um, this is put together by In Defense of Animals and animal communicator Joan Ranquit. We're delighted to introduce you to speakers who provide rays of hope during this time of political unrest. We have some helpline, some uh, the helpline, which is a wonderful tool for anyone who uh, would like to receive some support for your animal advocacy. Uh, the phone number for that is 1-800-705-0425. And we also have advocacy kits on the website for this event, which is idausa.org slash hope summit. I'm your host, Lisa Levinson, the director of In Defense of Animals Sustainable Activism Campaign, offering emotional and spiritual tools for animal activists. Please turn off your microphones and your webcams for the duration of the webinar. We will have a Q&A session following the presentation, which will be monitored by uh, Sally Jenkins. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to my co-host, Joan Ranquit, who will introduce our featured speaker for today. Thank you, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, so today we have Toni Frohoff, PhD, and she is a wildlife behavioral biologist who has studied the lives, loves, and liberties of cetaceans and elephants for 30 years. She specializes in the study of interspecies psychology, ecology, and well-being of non-human animals in the wild and captivity. Dr. Frohoff spearheads in defense of animals, elephant and cetacean campaigns, exposing the conflict between captivity and conservation and championing, championing the psychological, ecological, cultural and physical well-being of elephants and cetaceans. Dr. Frohoff has authored many papers, two books, Between, Between Species by the Sierra Club Books, uh, University of California Press, and Dalton Mitteries. Uh, published by Yale University Press, and has contributed chapters to over a dozen over a dozen anthologies and encyclopedias. Most recently, with Dr. Mark Beckoff, she co-authored the section on ethics for the Encyclopedia of Marine Mammals. Her pioneering research and advocacy has contributed to the legislation protecting wildlife in over a dozen countries and has been featured extensively in the media. Dr. Frohoff is a world-class lecturer, sharing her knowledge at eminent establishments, including the Smithsonian Institute, TED Global in Oxford, and the upcoming symposium on interdependence in Belgium. Thank you for joining us. It's so great to have you. Thank you, Joan. Great to be here. And thank you all for putting together such a uh, unique and positive uh, presentation opportunity. And I hope we get some good questions in later. Can you all hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, sounds good. Well, I'm going to launch into my presentation. So let me go ahead and share the screen and how the magic hopefully happens. Okay, is that visible to everybody? So there'll be a minor delay and when you when you press the button, did you press another button on the the front of the screen too where it said share screen? I pressed share screen. Okay, very good. So are you still waiting to see something? Yeah. Okay, let me try share screen one more time because you never know what's in the background here. Any luck now? Not yet. Okay. I'm going to try something different. When you Shoot. open it up, if you see a um, It'll probably give you the option to share a PowerPoint. Oh, there we go. Very good. I just got that one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, as you can see, the uh, 
title of my talk today is, <laughs> I don't know if you see what I see, but it's uh, pretty fascinating, is communication and collaboration with cetaceans, cetaceans being dolphins and whales, and elephants. So I know this doesn't look like a photo of an elephant. So this is a free ranging bottlenose dolphin in the wild who has initiated interaction of her own accord with certain individuals on her terms. But we are going to talk about communication and collaboration with cetaceans and elephants, with cetaceans as the primary emphasis. Part of this reason is that um, as I think we'd all agree the central question of our time is how humans can better cohabitate with an integral part of ecological systems as part of ecological systems towards salvaging the remaining environmental integrity that all species and all of us need to survive. So I'm starting with dolphins and whales, not just because in my career of about 30 years, uh, that's what I began um, the pursuit of um, those animals and those wonderful beings. But I also um, think that they provide unique opportunities in that they are exceptional among wild animals and that they sometimes will initiate interactive social behavior on their own accord in the absence of food provision. In a sense, this is what might be called as the lure of interspecies communication of which dolphins may be considered the holy grail. So as I said, um, it's not completely uncommon for certain cetacean dolphin whale individuals to create brief or even complex and sustained interactions and relationships with humans that construct interspecies bridges in involving so much more respect, research, inspiration, and ethical exploration to expand our concept of who cetaceans and all other animals are in our very more than human world. So the exaggerated divide between humans and other animals is often minimized when we learn of experiments in which dolphins or elephants or, or other primates such as chimpanzees are more like humans. And so hopefully we're learning to expand our awareness of what is intelligence and know that through dolphins, for example, they don't look anything like humans and yet their intelligence, their ability to comprehend concepts and convey them to each other and even to humans sometimes is beyond extraordinary and perhaps surpasses many of our own abilities. So as we learn and relearn to communicate with and collaborate ideally with multi-species cultures and communities. We obviously are called upon to look at re-examination of our own cultures and communities and uh, policies in our human world and the differences that we see or don't see between us. And I've got a photo of the humpback whales here and you probably have all heard some of a humpback whale song, thanks to Dr. Dr. Roger Payne back in the 70s. And that's actually a culturally transmitted song that changes every year in a very complex form of communication. And in acknowledgement that other animals have voices of their own, I can't play their sounds at the moment, but if you can evoke them in your imagination, I've really learned for myself that because animals have their own voices, we can learn a lot more, not just about them, but from them through animal listening rather than animal whispering. I know animal whispering is a big thing that a lot of people are doing. And um, as Joan will probably elaborate on, uh, sometimes that doesn't always involve listening as much. So that's a skill that I've learned from humpback whales, dolphins, and elephants, among others. So um, this multidisciplinary approach is really rooted in indigenous models, um, their relationships with nature, but it also acknowledges the indigenous culture of the whales, dolphins, elephants, and other animals on this planet that they have as well. 
they are indigenous beings of this planet. So ecotourism is something that I will talk on, but, um, and this is, as uh, Joan may see a photo of some people uh, swimming with free ranging dolphins off of Bimini. And this was taken by Wild Quest. And the main thrust of any relationship is the ability to respect and honor the other person's face, uh, requests, choices. And in this case, it's always on the dolphin's terms. And this is, in fact, how the only form of true ecotourism can occur. Because if whales are being pursued aggressively by boats or people are just jumping in on top of dolphins or invading their space, that doesn't work. And so that sounds really basic, but even I, as an expert, am still learning the etiquette of dolphins, whales, and elephants. So we're still learning so much and have so far to go. And as I mentioned, dolphins often give us a really unique opportunity to learn who they are in the wild. And this is a very unique photograph of, uh, well, they're all special, a particular dolphin named Mara in the Irish Sea who selects a few individuals to interact with. And she's been doing this for about 10 years. And she is not open to just anybody coming over and swimming towards her as if she were a toy or an object. And as Dr. Elliot Katz, who founded In Defense of Animals, has often saying, with domestic animal, well, companion animals, we are guardians, not owners. And when it comes to being with wild, other wild animals, if we want to consider ourselves wild or domesticated, I don't know, I prefer the former, uh, it's always appropriate to acknowledge their personhood. In this case, Mara has actually picked up a camera, an underwater camera from somebody in the water. And so she has created, in a sense, her own choice preference research study um, in which I'll elaborate. I'll elaborate on that a little more later. But what began as a game for her, playing back and forth with the camera and other objects actually became an investigation, whether she was investigating us or we were investigating her, um, had, it still remains to be seen, but there's so much that we can learn from these encounters that are in the wild, but always again, on their terms, 150%. So here I'll go to elephants because after spending decades of uh, being fortunate enough to be in the company of dolphins and whales, um, sometimes in bad situations, such as captivity. I also had wonderful opportunities to learn from Dr. Cynthia Moss and Dr. Ian Douglas Hamilton and Dr. Joyce Poole, um, who I consider the Jane Goodalls of the elephant world, to spend time with them, uh, these two, with these elephants in uh, Africa and East Africa. And so I got to learn about how not only are they studied, but how they are seen for who they are, for having so many similar traits to humans and their incredibly complex social lives. You'll notice in the wild, you always see multi-generational families together, unless they're all bulls, the males together. And so their societies um, are just as tight, if not tighter than our own familial bonds. Now, when I started working at in Defense of Animals, just a year or two ago, I really wanted to expand what was happening with cetacean, dolphin and whale protection um, to elephants uh, because of the wonderful elephant campaign that IDA's had going for many years. And one of the things I noted is that with the advent of the movie Blackfish um, and to another degree, um, some other documentaries, uh, Blackfish really created a new era in which people started viewing dolphins and orcas in particular in captivity in a different light. So I'm hoping that our work with elephants can kind of go on the wave of Blackfish in that regard. 
And the points are actually quite obvious, the similarities between cetaceans and elephants, in particular, uh, many orca societies, uh, particularly the resident populations in the Pacific Northwest, for example, where we know each individual by name, their genealogy, their age, all sorts of aspects, even their vocal dialects. So cetaceans and elephants share similar cognitive, social, psychological characteristics, capacities, and needs. And this is the same in the wild, but also I've been finding more and more in captivity. They exhibit complex and lifelong social bonds, including matriarchal societies and cultures. Orcas and all cetaceans and elephants share highly sophisticated communicative abilities. In a sense, the whales make sounds, some low frequency sounds that travel um, for indefinite amounts of miles, depending on the sounds in the water. Uh, so they'll communicate through the water for hundreds, if not thousands of miles, if the oceans are quiet enough. Whereas the elephants have just been found to have low frequency sounds that we can't even hear, and they communicate through the earth. Two different mediums, very similar principles. So um, the females of elephants and pilot whales and orcas, um, and perhaps many other cetacean species live well past menopause. And this leads to matriarchal societies that serve as vital repositories of, of knowledge. So when I say serving as vital repositories of knowledge, it means that these old female elephants, it's not only that they share their traditions and their stories, but they also are essential to their survival of their societies and their cultures. And when one of them is lost, it can devastate the entire herd or the entire pod. So um, as I mentioned, some of my work has been uh, studying dolphins and whales and elephants in uh, some of the most uh, horrible situations, uh, including captive environments. And this is something that um, I learned years ago, uh, before Blackfish came out, that we were really, when we were separating ourselves between glass like this, or with fences or bars, it's us and them, and there's a separation between humans and all other beings. And when we put bars in front of elephants, and we put orcas and tanks, we're also really taking away from them what makes them most elephants and orcas. So we essentially, as a bird in a cage analogy would be, we take what is perhaps most unique and important to them, freedom and family and their societies and the wild. And when you take that away, we get left with vestigial remains of what is left, even though there still are who's um, we're not seeing them for who they truly can be if they were left on their own devices. So in a sense, this is blackfish behind bars. Uh, both orcas in, particularly, in particular and elephants are similarly iconic in captivity. Every zoo, every ocean area seems to want an orca, although fortunately, not so often now with orcas uh, because of blackfish and decades of uh, persistence by advocates and scientists. Uh, they're similarly traumatized in captivity, as I mentioned, in particularly because of their social, incredible social bonds. And they also are from vulnerable populations and species. And when we look at what we collectively as humans still often do, this is in the United States, it's not even in the East, this is occurring at a zoo called Natural Bridge Zoo. Uh, we dominate these wild animals. This man has a bull hook, which is a sharp instrument of, of abuse and torture and control. And we get rides from them. And that is still happening now. And for anybody interested in knowing what we're doing about it, please see in Defense of Animals, 10 Worst Zoos for Elephants. And we're in our 13th year. And this is one of our 10 more zoos. We're hoping to shut this place down. This is Asha the elephant, and she has been alone there for far too many years. 
and she, she needs to go to sanctuary, a certified sanctuary. Similarly, when we look at Miami Seaquarium, we see an orca by herself in essence. She's there with some dolphins, but she likely can't speak their language, nor they hers. And she's been in that tank for far too long, essentially by herself, and is still being used to provide rides. Uh, back in the early 90s, I conducted what was the first Swim with the Dolphin study, uh, looking at the captive Swim with the Dolphin programs that were becoming so popular in the late 80s and the early 90s. And uh, through my work in Florida Keys, I decided to conduct a study for my graduate work that would focus not on the experience for the humans, but for the dolphins. Uh, the humans looked like they were enjoying themselves, but nobody seemed to be asking how the dolphins in captivity were faring uh, in the process of being captured, confined in captivity, and coerced into performing these degrading behaviors. And so, as a result, my study also revealed a lot of aggression on the part of dolphins against people. And I noted many, many people becoming injured, some hospitalized from the dolphins who were probably traumatized, very much like their um, orca cousins um, in captivity uh, when put in too much proximity with humans under too much stress and trauma. I received a call from a journalist at Esquire magazine last year about why our 10 worst elephant list, um, how that could be sexy enough to be in Esquire magazine. So I equated that with orcas. And so the journalist said, why elephants in American zoos, maybe the new orcas and blackfish. And that's a really, um, I think he's a great interview and biased because it was a great conversation with him and a, and they were my words, and I tend to believe what I say, and less things change over time. But at the same time, he added a twist to help make elephants and orca captivity something that might be relatable to humans. And speaking of captivity, one of the new ways in which zoos are justifying their existence is by saying that they are in existence for conservation of elephants or orcas or other animals. And especially in the case of elephants and orcas, they're dying far faster than they can reproduce. And they're stealing from the wild to restock their captive uh, prisoners to be on exhibit for human recreation, the educational benefits of which we know little. Um, and none, to my understanding, have been peer reviewed in the scientific literature. So there's a big con in conservation in zoos when it comes to elephants and orcas in particular. Instead of putting the hundreds of millions of dollars into creating exhibits to maintain these large uh, animals uh, in captivity and typically in great misery, the only real conservation can occur in the wild. And that's where real conservation needs to occur because we need to protect them and their natural habitats. They go hand in hand just as, as they do for us. So we go from seeing dolphins, whales, elephants, and hopefully all animals as a source of resource to, a, to people, persons whom we respect. They may not be humans, but they are no longer resources and they still deserve our respect. And that's a whole paradigm shift that involves our daily actions, the way scientists conduct research, um, our policy and legislation. And that leads me to ask, who are the cetaceans, the dolphins and whales, or the elephants or any other animal for that matter, but in this case, the cetaceans? Because it's who, not what they are. They are persons of different species with great individuality amongst them. There's great diversity of species, but also cultures and individual personalities and proclivities. Uh, they have what my colleague Kathleen Dzinski calls dolphinalities. So many dolphins have just as unique personalities, I would say, as we do. And they are multifaceted in their intelligence, communication, social awareness, 
uh, cultures and ethical, moral, and emotional complexities and scenarios. Interspecies communication, uh, from my perspective, I tend to go from the route of science, but I also look, as I said, at indigenous humans and indigenous whales, dolphins, and elephants, um, is intercultural as well as interspecies. So when we're interacting with one group of orcas or one group of, an, of elephants, um, they're not going to just have the same social mores and etiquette. Um, but when we learn that, we can go from respect and uh, to respect from seeing them as a resource, which is still happening all over the world, including in the United States. So many times we think we're exempt from that, but we are exploiting them just as much in many ways um, and in North America um, than most other countries. And hopefully through interspecies communication, we become more animal centric versus being anthropocentric. Animal centric being we are animals versus anthropocentric being it's all about we humans and then all the other billions of species. That's my scientific term for it on the planet. So we can go from interspecies communication. And uh, when I have the luxury of speaking personally and not just scientifically, I also address interspecies communion. And I use the word communion in the um, secular sense. It's a mutual understanding that occurs with transcendence of language. And yes, there are behavioral cues, perhaps with your cat or dog, you'll exchange behaviors, glances, uh, vocalizations. But I think most, if not all of you watching, have experienced something that seems to transcend these vocal, maybe even olfactory and uh, visual signs. And the indigenous humans did understand this, uh, at least many of them did, and still practice this in whatever ways they can. Um, and that's something that's led me to pursue uh, my current project is Wild Wisdom with Dr. Deborah Durham. And uh, that's a whole other project, but it's something that uh, is an evolution of what we have learned from being with and learning from these animals, other animals, who we initially thought we were studying and ultimately ended up being our teachers. So when we go away from being so anthropocentric, we can look at ourselves, as you see the man, this is actually uh, Will Anderson from In Defense of Animals. Um, and he is in a boat interacting with two gray whales. And this is in the uh, lagoon of Baja, San Ignacio. And he was very wary to put his arm over the side. And uh, basically, uh, the mother pushed the baby up to the boat. And in these situations in which there is respect over seeing these whales as a resource for money or exploitation or whale watching, miraculous things that extend beyond the fable of the boy riding the dolphin, really, I mean, these things happen in real life, but only if they're protected with constant listening to what the other species needs and wants and choices are. Because sometimes we don't always see them, let alone have them come up to our boat. And this again is a colleague of mine, she's a photographer and she did not want to touch the whales. She thought that was too invasive. And I want to make a disclaimer, we are not advocating that anybody um, go out and try to touch any wild animals anywhere. This is a very exceptional situation led by very exper experienced scientists and tour guides in which a relationship for generations of humans and, and whales, gray whales, have evolved. So if there's any take home message with these touchy feely photos is that she again did not try to touch the whale. The boat was, sta sanctu was uh, stationary and the whale came up and really pretty much put his or her face in her face until she put her hand out because that's what they're accustomed to there. No food provisioning, but please, um, again, this is a very delicate uh, aspect of trust and safety for both humans and other animals and very rare. Another rare situation occurs when there are solitary cetaceans. This is a beluga whale in Wilma whom we were studying in Nova Scotia. 
off the coast of Nova Scotia, and uh, she was geographically isolated from others of her kind. And we hope that she has since made it back. And uh, but it was a really unique opportunity to learn not just about her, but from her in the process of trying to have her rejoin her group. And another cetacean example, uh, some of you may have seen the movie, The Whale. And this is about uh, a Lun Luna, an orca who was separated uh, from his family. And uh, probably because presumably his uncle, he went off with his uncle, he was a juvenile orca and the orca and the uncle uh, presumably died and Luna was in this inlet. And there's a whole movie about Luna. The Nuchinov tribe uh, asked myself and other scientists to come up and help with the situation because Luna wanted to be with people, humans, because he could not find any others of his kind. And it was a very poignant and powerful time and he literally would come up to the dock. And even though people tried to dissuade him from interacting with humans, um, he couldn't find his own kind. And leading from that, and those are situations initiated by the cetaceans in the wild, we come to interspecies miscommunication. So in my quest to study interspecies communication, I unfortunately ended up specializing for a while in miscommunication. And that picture, I think, speaks for itself. Um, anybody who's been around wild dolphins knows that's an unnatural behavior. And this is a situation in captivity. And the dolphin appears to be smiling, but their smile is a fixed facial feature, as many of us have written about and uh, talked about. So miscommunication occurs with dolphins, elephants all the time. They look fine, they look happy. And even as experts, we have to really look and listen deeply to see how they're doing and what their needs are. So we can go from interspecies miscommunication with some of the examples I'm showing here to interspecies communication and communion. And it's really nice to be able to talk about this because so often I'm giving presentations about miscommunication and where we're missing the mark. And this is a, a summit on hope and the potential that we have as humans to reconnect with others uh, with whom we share the planet. And so these are just really incredible examples of how we can do that. And in this process, we experience mutual thriving. It's not just what's sustainable. It's not just what the individual or the environment can sustain or tolerate. It's not coexistence because we all have a right to thrive as well as to survive. And at this point, we need that right. And if other organisms and, and beings, being other animals, maybe plants by some people's definitions, are thriving, we are more likely to thrive psychologically and uh, physiologically, and there are many scientific studies to support that. I'm showing now what is a picture of a dolphin in the wild with a dog, and I want to show this because it's not just humans who are so special. I know that I have often thought, I'm human, I'm special, that's why this dolphin is so interested in me, and I have um, really been properly humbled and seen how sometimes uh, a dog or um, a fish can be more interesting than I can, certainly, and to a dolphin. So we're really not all that special, but we are special in what we share. So again, I'm stressing that all these images of humans with uh, other animals in the wild are on their terms, in very rare circumstances. And this is an example, I think I'm very aware of the times, so I want to move briefly. But in uh, this is a photo in Brazil, and uh, there have been dolphins and humans cooperatively fishing together in this fairly remote area in Brazil and in some areas around the world, also other areas, but particularly in this region 
where there have been generations of human fishermen who fish with multiple generations of dolphins because they've been doing it for so many de decades and the life cycle of dolphins is somewhat similar in the wild to that of humans. And so the dolphins initiated herding the fish into the nets for the fishermen and the fish then benefit in this fairly remote area. So it's something that was initiated again by the dolphins and the fishermen know if they blow it, this uh, what is developing to be a multi-generational and multicultural relationship will go away. So the dolphins really do um, come first in this. And, um, you know, it's a luxury to be on and around the ocean. And we're not always lucky enough to have dolphins who just come up to us like this, but it does happen. And we are in a world of documentaries and YouTube videos and so many exceptional ways in which we can share these experiences with one another. Um, and also, um, uh, this brings us back to indigenous humans and indigenous whales. This photo is of the Nuchonoth tribe where they were greeting Luna, the orca. Uh, you can see in the center, it says, welcome baby orca. And they have had their own relationship. You can see the carvings on the boat with orcas for millennia. So again, just as I'm humbled with other species, especially those who have been on the planet far longer than we hominids have, I also uh, often really pay respect when, and learn from whenever possible the traditions of these uh, indigenous people. I'm not going to read all of this about interspecies collaborative research, except to tell you that it's a a way of studying dolphins, whales, and perhaps other uh, non-human animals who want to interact with us. And I've been working on this with Dr. Lori Marino, who you might have seen in Blackfish. She's a neuroscientist. And uh, it's a, towards a new paradigm of non-captive research on cetacean cognition. So there are opportunities for this all over. And we can go from this in the top left, where at least on my screen, where the dolphins are in captivity, to being in the wild with them on their terms. And then we really are learning more about them and who they are. So again, interspecies communication and collaborative research is something that has put, one day maybe a dolphin will be a co-author on a scientific paper because really they're the ones creating the rules in their, in their home, it's our playground. And I bring this around to listening, animal listening. We don't always have to be whispering, let alone talking, even though I've been talking for this last half hour. <laughs> and if we are patient, they will even come up to the shore at times. I know these are miraculous, rare incidences, but this happens um, over years, decades of trust. And we learn to listen to them. And so we have this opportunity now to exploit or evolve. And I think that this is a really great opportunity for us to see how we can evolve in a multidisciplinary and multicultural, multi-species format. And we can learn from our elders in the sea in the same ways that we can learn from our elders on land. In this case, elephants who have had sophisticated complex societies for far longer than we humans probably have. So with communication and collaboration, I conclude with remembering that we go from what to who or whom. The word it does not apply to a living being anymore, especially when we know that they are sentient. We go from resource to respect. We go from surviving to mutual thriving. For humans to thrive, we need mutual thriving with other species. And we go from mankind being anthropocentric to humankind, to what I like to consider animal kind. As part of this, I call this reparations. Uh, I'm an advisor on uh, several sanctuary projects, and I say certified sanctuary projects um, by GFAS. Uh, the Whale Sanctuary Project is one on which uh, 
um, Dr. Lori Marino and others um, have created and I'm advising for um, them in my capacity in defense of animals. And this is, would be the first sanctuary for dolphins and whales possibly ever in the world for currently captive dolphins and whales. And it would be a seaside sanctuary. So um, I invite you to go to their website or look at our own posts on in defense of animals to learn more about you can get involved in this. And I want to just say goodbye to the dolphins and the whales I've known in these photos and the elephants by saying that when we redefine we, we become stronger and larger. And we know the time is now. We're at a tipping point. So um, please join us as we uh, hopefully dip in the right direction. Oh, well, thank you so much, Tony, for that amazing presentation. That was fabulous. And I so appreciate you sharing um, what you've learned. Uh, and we're about to move into um, the Q&A section of our presentation. And that means that um, folks can write into the chat box if you'd like to. You can write in there what your any questions or comments, and uh, Sally, who's monitoring the chat box, will will review them and and share them with Tony. Yes, I will. So, uh, it normally takes a few moments for people to yeah. type in their questions and and uh, get them answered. But uh, Joan, do you have ones? Do you oh, start to say so? I thought you might. I had a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I almost texted you to say, I can go first. I um, knew already. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm looking forward. Was, yeah, I love that. You have no idea how much I love that because it's something I talk about. Um, uh, Sally knows and there's a gal on here, Leanne, and people will hear this later that, you know, I, I always talk about how we can have as animal communicators, we can have this communication with our domestic animals. It's far more sophisticated. But when we get out into the wild, it's like bringing our energy field in and just listening and communing. So I really love the, to have the uh, scientific version of exactly what I'm saying. So thank you. Um, and then uh, I wanted to share with you that, uh, and then I have a question for you. Um, I, uh, years ago on my birthday, I went up um, to, I, I lived up in the Seattle area. So I went up to Friday Harbor and um, I was in a boat for a week. And this one day um, we were out on the boat and a whale came to us and came under us. And I took pictures of his eyes and ended up going straight to the whale museum and identifying him. And he was uh, K23, which is Scoter. And so then I signed up for naturalist courses and I'm, I'm on my second course and I've gone whale crazy um but what i wondered is um because i was already dolphin crazy but now i had to be like an or <laughs> i'm a dorka <laughs> an orca dork <laughs> i'm already a dippy right a dolphin hippie so now i'm a dippy and a dorka <laughs> um but i have i have a few questions about um that and then some elephant questions and i'll start with the with the whales so do you feel like um, when, like with whale watching or things like that, I mean, there are times that people believe that whales are performing for them when they really could just have an itch on their back. Where do you fall? Because I I got to know everybody up at the Whale Museum and, you know, they'll have like, I don't know if they like that. And I've gone out with Soundwatch and been in a little boat yelling at whale watchers and so I've been on both, you know what I mean? Like I've I've participated in both. And so what do you think happens when like uh, 200 people are clapping and going crazy over some whale's activity and then the whale seemingly continues on doing it? Do you think that they pick up on that love or um, on that um, fanfare? That's such a great question, Joan. And I might ask question back to you <laughs> too, because I'd like yeah. to get your perceptions. Um, 
it's so relative to context. I mean, first of all, I think that I myself, of course, it's it's usually not about me, right? I Me mean, as a human, and then with other species, I, I sh- like I showed the example of the dog in the water. It's like, what do you mean? Yeah. Why is the dolphin playing with the dog? It's like, well, I'm sure the dog probably has much more interesting something to share with with that dolphin at that moment. And um, there's this human exceptionalism, right? And that we've been raised to believe that we're exceptional, in, at least in most of our cultures, as human beings and not part of the animal world. And so when we take that off, um, it's, I think it's freeing. It's, it's less lonely. And then we're out there with the whales. And, you know, I would say that it depends on the situation because, for example, uh, a New York Times journalist, a great guy, uh, Charles Siebert, he was doing an article on this exact same question because people were asking if the if the whales were communicating with the people. You saw the photos in Baja Lagoon, in Baja Lagoon where the whales were literally eliciting touch uh, from the people in the pongas in the small boats. And I said, of course, it's communication, um, you know, even in its simplest form. And that's an obvious thing. And so he wanted to document that through his eyes and through his beautiful writing. But then when you see uh, another person, dolphin or otherwise doing something, just because we're applauding, does that mean, if I understand your question right, that they are feeling a sense of positivity from our emotions or our behavior or our voices, whatever it is that we're uh, sharing with them. And, and of course, it could be possible. It could be about us to a certain degree. And other times it probably has nothing to do with us. For example, when you come across, you know, some individuals who are um, reaching and then they'll stop and go away. And if you're, if you're, you're with Soundwatch and you've been with good boat operators who won't follow the whales, but if they're doing that around us, it's hard to not think, okay, is there a relationship occurring through these behaviors and a reciprocal response and action. So what's your take on that? Um, well, I've, I've kind of seen both. I mean, I think about, you know, I, I, as much as I'm the animal communicator and you would think that I would go like, oh yeah, of course they're, you know, grooving on this. I, I think about the way that they see. So I think that for one thing, they might be curious and they might come out and look at first and be like, wow, that is a lot of people, you know, and then I think that it, it progresses. I think that probably some of the first actions they do are for themselves. And then I think something kind of builds that that's the sense I've had when I've been, when I've watched, like I've been far away and watched, um, a whale just being his own self and doing his own thing. And then he's done something that's gotten a response way, you know, from a boat way over there. And it it does seem to have a building. And then I think he gets bored and goes, okay, I got I'm out of here. Um, whereas I've seen the dolphins as, you know, down in Bimini, they, they would get on the boat with us at some point, you know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think, I think it's both. I think it is usually starts something for themselves and then a relationship kind of is created out of the moment. That's my sense. But but I've been on the little boat with Soundwatch. Thanks. Yeah, it's funny because I've on Soundwatch, you know, we've been backing off the um, the whale watching boats, which is no small task. Um, And you're in these orange suits, so you look tough. And uh, the next thing you know, I've had whales come as close as those whales that you're touching. And I, I mean, those whales are way bigger than the boat we're on. And so I did feel like that was, you know, I wouldn't call it a thank you, but it was sort of, it was like a little drive by, hi, how's it going? You know, it was very, so I've had lots of experiences, not lots, but you know, a few days worth of really profound moments where it did feel like they wanted to see who we were just as much as we wanted to see who they were. Beautiful. Yeah, I think there's a, a continuum where sometimes it absolutely has nothing to do with us. And sometimes yeah. it completely is is a synergy. Yeah. 
Yeah. Really cool. I love what you're doing. Then may I ask an elephant question? Of course. Um, so a lot of times, and this is so, you know, can drive me crazy, but um, people will say, oh, well, when the Ringling Brothers breaks up the elephants, you know, they're just going to have to put them down. And so where are, I mean, is there a list of places where elephants that get retired get to go and how can we raise money for them so that they can stay with their families? What, what is something that can be done for the elephants that are finally getting to leave these situations so that we can shut some people up on Facebook and carry on? Love that question. Uh, the Ringling Brothers situation, I think pretty much anybody in the Western Hemisphere knows that Ringling Brothers has shut down the Elephant Acts and is essentially shut down. Uh, and so the elephant per performances and having elephants travel in such um, extraordinarily uh, uncomfortable, if not dangerous ways and a horrible way of life for them in particular, um, that's come to an end. I've never heard anybody say put the elephants down because there is such a market for captive elephants, but um, I'm sure I will eventually. Uh, but I, the problem with the Ringling Brothers situation in part is that they refer to their elephants having gone to their sanctuary, their conservation center, where uh, many scientists, including myself, have yet to see real conservation occur in any format. And this is certainly not a sanctuary, uh, certified sanctuary. Um, and there are elephant sanctuaries to certified by the Global Federation. Um, of associated sanctuaries and GFAS, and they are in the US. And one is PAWS in California, the other is the Elephant Sanctuary in Hole and Wall, Tennessee. And there's a new one now in Brazil, and there are various sanctuaries, um, not all of them being sanctuaries, but some of them being certified um, in various other parts of the world. Those sanctuaries currently have space for um, many elephants right now. So we do not have a shortage of sanctuaries. We have a need for those elephants to be sent to the place that can most closely approximate their lives in nature and meet their needs socially and physically, uh, which are not being met uh, by any means in most captive situations. So then uh, almost the Ringling Brothers then getting them to not perform is almost like step one. So there almost has to be a step two then to see if we can shame them into getting them into one of these places. I, I hope it's I hope it's inspiring them, but it could be shame. I mean, it's like kind of like with SeaWorld stock prices yeah. falling. Um, so it, this this effect, this, this blackfish effect may be having some impact on elephants and all other animals. Again, um, all other animals are important. And yet, because elephants and orcas in particular are so large and charismatic, uh, they really are great keystone species, so to speak, for us to educate people about the challenges uh, that they face being used and actually exploited in entertainment. Uh, and for recreation under the guise of conservation or education. So people can certainly support those sanctuaries. There are, it's an orphanage uh, run by Daphne Sheldrake in Nairobi, just outside of Nairobi. Oh um, my if God, you go I to go our, Yeah, if you go to In Defense of Animals, go to our elephant webpage and uh, our campaign site, and I'd be more than happy to, if you don't see what you're looking for there, I'll give you some references and we'll keep you posted. Yeah, I've been a big uh, Daphne uh, groupie for a while. <laughs> She's amazing. Yeah. We have a comment from Kristen. Um, and um, then, uh, did you want to go, Joan? Oh, yeah, of course. I'm, I'll just real quick. 
There's a, a place on one of the islands out, not 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 Friday Harbor, but um, not not San Juan Island, but one of the islands where they've actually um, created a space where a salmon hatchery uh, dumps, you know, that's where they all end up in the sea, um, where they're hoping that if they ever free Lolita, that that would be where she would go. They've got a, and then that way the, um, the JK and L pod would flow through there and she'd at least get to see her family, but remain safe. And then eventually hopefully get to be with her family. So um, have you heard about that place? Uh, yes, and uh, in fact, the whale sanctuary project um, on which I advise, uh, we are looking into all possibilities um, on both coasts. Uh, perhaps it would be Eastern Canada or the U.S. for belugas or Western uh, areas for orcas, uh, Northwest areas. And uh, as you well pointed out, uh, the goal of uh, many sanctuaries is to if it to see if in the individuals are candidates for reintroduction to the wild and in some cases that may not be uh, deemed the case but uh, certainly for Lolita whose family is still alive and for um, Corky uh, whose family is still alive there are several orcas who are isolated and yet their families are still alive and they still share the same language and dialect even. So cool, hopefully. Um, we just have a comment from Kristen who said, uh, thank you, Tony. That was absolutely fascinating. I love the idea of respect over resource and I wish many of our wildlife managers would begin to think this way. So I have no other chat boxes. So, Joan, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free. Mm. All you. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I just, you know, it's funny because my bonus call, um, Lisa and Sally and I just did my bonus call, and we talked so much about the indigenous nature of these pods and the the elephant herds, and I talked a lot about the indigenous nature of people on the planet and how historically up until the Europeans, there was relationship and respect with regard to, we weren't um, uh, anthropocentric, we were in relation to, in relation with animals and the earth. And that went out the window somewhere. So I love, it seemed, it was a really good co uh, synergy there. Yeah, and there are so many more of us now, and that's just expanding so much. So if anything, our respect and preparations need to be that much more expansive. Uh, what, on the line of that, uh, marine protected areas, I'm working with Laura Bridgman, at, who's at IDA, and uh, also at We Are Sonar about um, seeing cetaceans viewed as stakeholders. Uh, this is a process that she envisioned um, where dolphins and whales could be viewed as cetacean, as stakeholders in marine protected environments. And I personally, when I went to the last International Whaling Commission meeting, um, where people were talking about whales in terms of biomass of flesh rather than any anything that we would consider, yeah. um, I really wanted to see uh, not just human indigenous nations represented as they already are, but also whale nations, uh, indigenous whales represented, uh, and maybe someday that will happen. Um, the goal. Hmm. That's a beautiful vision, Tony. It really is. It's all the, all the animal nations sitting together to discuss what, what is the best for everyone. Um, and I appreciated your emphasis of that during the presentation today. It's a different perspective, and I think it's important to bring that perspective in into to our science. Thanks, yeah. Lisa. Yeah, if we do enough science, I think we're going to get, you know, actually get there. We're already realizing that traditional knowledge of indigenous people was so much of it was correct, and we're catching up to some of that even too. So. Yeah. 
So thank you very much to Tony for that amazing presentation and also for um, my co-host to Joan and Sally and thank to you. everyone who's who's been listening to our Hope for Animals Summit and uh, specifically to this presentation today. Um, you'll, you'll find Tony has an advocacy kit. So if you want to learn more about what uh, her campaign is up to these days and, and how to get involved, you can go to IDAUSA.org slash Hope Summit. And next to where her presentation is, you'll see her advocacy kit. So I encourage you to check that out. And um, we also have uh, one more <laughs> Hope Hope. Summit presentation coming up this uh, Thursday. So we hope you can tune in for Mark Beckoff. He's an animal behaviorist author, and he will be um, speaking with us on Thursday. So we hope you can tune in and join us then. That would be great. Thank you. Thanks to Thank everyone. Thanks. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.